Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Light on the Rock, where the messages are free. We focus on our Father and Yeshua, our Savior, uh, Jesus the Christ, and look forward to uh, elevating and pointing everybody to them. We're getting um, ever closer to Passover, and so it might be very good for everybody, if you'd like to get some Passover, pre-Passover sermons, uh, check the February, March, and April months of previous years. There are a lot of many, a lot of, a lot of pre-Passover topics in there, a lot of them, many of them. Don't miss them. Uh, do this in remembrance of me when I see the blood. These are some of the titles. The deeper meaning of the Passover emblems, crucified with Christ, and so many more. So uh, let's begin. Be sure to print out notes uh, before beginning to listen to the audio because I will go through the scriptures rather quickly and having the notes ahead of time will really help you keep up and will fill in a lot of the gaps. In my college years, I attended a four-year liberal arts theology-based college in England. I love those years. We made lots of lifelong friends from those years, people we still meet up with and see and have a lot of good times with. One of the things I remember was we had an area in our men's dorm reserved for, they were called prayer closets, uh, places where you could go in to pray and be private without being interrupted. And since it was a religious college, we also heard a lot about prayer and how to pray. We often heard a verse or two out of James 5 about praying fervently. Our prayers had to be fervent. So somehow I began to equate that with all kinds of concepts, like maybe praying with gusto or even praying loudly and so forth. Uh, I had to be sure to include vigorous hand gestures, I thought, while praying to be fervent. I don't know that anyone ever taught those concepts, but somehow I began to believe a prayer had to be audible, persuasive, confident. Yes, at least 30 minutes long. I remember some students' prayers could be heard through the prayer closets as they were praying so loudly. And perhaps they thought that fervent prayer meant to be loud. Why? Well, because some of the most effective prayers in the Bible didn't necessarily fulfill those things I just said. And yet they were very fervent, as you'll see. Are your prayers fervent? Turn now with me to James 5, verses 16 to 18. And this is our topic today. Are your prayers fervent prayers? James 5, 16 to 18. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed, that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Boy, there's a lot in that sentence. Number, uh, verse 17, James 5, 17. Elijah was a man with nature just like ours, And he prayed earnestly, a different word in both the Greek and the English. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, why should we spend so much time on fervent prayer as a topic? Is it important? Well, I just read to you that um, I think most of us have some working knowledge of what fervent prayer might mean. But I think most of us also want to have our prayers working, that they avail much, that they're effective and they're powerful. Who wants ineffective prayers or prayers that don't avail much? There are many keys to answered prayer. This is such a big one. I want to focus entirely just on it, being fervent in our prayers and what that means. Uh, Again, I think you have some idea of what it means, but are your prayers fervent? And wouldn't this be a really good review, a good topic on prayer? Uh, We can always use a sermon on prayer. And if you, dear child of God, and if I, who also is a dear child of God, would just commit ourselves, frankly, to fervent prayer every time we prayed, there'd be no limit on what we'd see our great God Almighty doing in our lives, through our lives, through us as a group as his children. I really believe that. I think we all kind of know what it means. Well, let's, if you're honest, maybe you'll admit that you're not praying fervent prayers all the time. Certainly, I'll, I'll admit that, or even most of the time. And therefore, you're praying if it's not fervent. 
according to James 5.16, may not be as effective as it should be, may not be availing much. So this will be a great review for all of us, including me. And it also goes without saying that this verse goes on to say the prayers of a righteous man, the righteous people, are more effective than prayers of active sinners, unless those active sinners are pray fervently to be forgiven, and then their prayers are heard and effective, just like the publican and the Pharisee. You know, the publican said, Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and he went home justified. And there are also a few other things in these verses, such as a hint that if you want to be healed, maybe start praying fervently for others to be healed, that you may be healed, it says. Have you thought of that from that point of view? And pray even for those who hate you, uh, Yeshua said, Jesus said, and, and have insulted you. That prayer, of course, is to ask for their forgiveness and ask that God give them a tender heart and that they come to see the light, stop their evil words and ways. And then the end of verse 16, the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man are the ones that are most effective. So, so today, are we praying fervently? What makes a prayer a fervent prayer? Are they loud? Are they animated? What scriptures would you use to support your conclusions? I'm sure many fervent prayers are loud and animated. But as we shall see, some were not even audible. Some were just thought in the mind, as you shall see. And yet they were fervent. Do they have to be long? You'll find that some fervent prayers were all-nighters. Other fervent prayers literally were seconds. Can God see a fervent prayer? As a, uh, can, can a prayer to God as, be a fervent prayer if it's short? I think you'll see, you'll be surprised how short they can be. Anyway, when I was attending back in that college, it was often implied the fervent prayer was loud, powerful, animated. You catch my, my drift? So the English word fervent, the English word fervent, comes from the Latin word fer, fervere or ferver, to boil over, to be hot for what you're doing and saying, to be fervent, to be hot. The Greek has connotations of being stretched out, as in beseeching. The words labored fervently, which are used in Colossians 4.12, Colossians 4.12 of a man named Epaphras, or Epaphras, uh, how he labored fervently for you in prayer. That word, those two words, labored fervently, actually come from one Greek word, and see if you can figure out what, where we get an English word from it, agonizome, agoni, agonizome. Agonizome, where we get the word agonize from. And it's translated labor fervently. Now, do you remember Jacob wrestling all night with the man that he came, who became the one we know as Jesus Christ, Yeshua, until that man, with a capital M, would bless Jacob? Fervent prayer, in my opinion, after studying it, praying about it fervently, is a wrestling with God in prayer, putting your whole being into it, hanging on to him like Israel, like Jacob did, as you shall see in Genesis 32, 26. Genesis 32, 26, it says there that Jacob was not going to let God go until he received what he needed. He wanted the blessings. He wanted God to be true to his word and Tell him and bless him right then and there. And he wasn't going to let go until he got it. He wanted a new name, or at least he got one. That's fervent praying. we got to cling to God in prayer until, until he gives us the answers. Genesis 32, verse 26. Sometimes that clinging takes a long time, brethren. Genesis 32, 26, he said, Let me go. That was the one who became Yeshua. Let me go, because later on, uh, Jacob says, I have seen the face of God and live. Let me go for the day breaks. But he, Jacob, Yaakov in Hebrew, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So that's, to me, that statement to him was a fervent statement. Was a, uh, he, agon he literally agonized. He had his, uh, was it hamstring or something, uh, uh, pulled out, and that really hurts. I had a hamstring uh, injury last year. and really, really hurt. What examples from scriptures would you cite to illustrate fervent prayer? 
I think there's a real famous one. I'll make that number two, but I'm going to go to the one that James uses simply because James uses that in the same context of fervent prayer, and that was Elijah. If we keep reading in James 5, after verse 16, where it talks about the fervent prayer, we'll start with Elijah and move up from there. But uh, verses 17 and 18, he cites Elijah praying for it to stop raining for three and a half years, and it did stop raining. He said it'll stop raining until my word uh, ends it, uh, ends the drought. And we're, we're not told much about the prayer itself in Scripture. You can read about it in 1 Kings 17, the first seven verses. But what I get from that story is a strong faith. He stated there would be no rain except at his word, and that's what happened. On the other hand, when Elijah prayed for it to start raining again, he had to pray seven times. Seven times. And for six of those seven times, there was no sign that his prayers were being heard at all. Not at all. Yet he was very confident that at his word, bang, it would start to, it would start to rain. After all, that story is at the, the end of 1 Kings 18. And that story comes on the heels of when he asked God in prayer to vindicate him as his servant, as God's servant, to send down the fire from heaven. And it immediately happened. We'll read that in a second. So perhaps one point that we can get from fervent prayer is this, according to the context he uses Elijah. Are we really being fervent about a prayer topic, whether it's healing or needing a job or whatever it is, if we stop praying about it when we don't see the answer we ask for? Or do we, like Jacob, continue to cling, cling to the promises, cling to the uh, things God has said to us, that he knows our needs even before we ask, that he will not ever leave us or forsake us, that the righteous will not go hungry, and so on. So this was right after the miracle of the fire from heaven devouring the soaked sacrifices of Elijah, and again, right after an earnest, fervent prayer, but one that took less than a minute to say. In the meantime, the pagan priests of Baals had been fervently praying as well, hopping back and forth and dancing, and they even started lashing themselves from early in the morning till at least three in the afternoon. All to no avail. Remember the fervent, the effective fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. All, theirs was to no avail. Elijah prayed, and James says earnestly, a different word from the Hebrew word for fervent, but a word that implies heavy worship within the prayer. You can read how Elijah literally bowed his head between his knees seven times. He actually even announces to evil King Ahab, that he knew it would rain soon, and he better get on his way before the heavy rain stop you. He even said before there was even a cloud in the sky that he could hear the sound of the abundance, or there was the sound of abundance of rain before there was even a cloud in the sky. That's how confident Elijah was. So fervency also implies that we are fervent, we are wrestling, we are hanging on there, we are putting our hearts into it. Because of faith, we believe deeply, deeply that there is a God in heaven who loves his children and hears our prayers. Let's read it. 1 Kings 18, instead of just talking about it, 41 to 46. 1 Kings 18, 41 to 46. And then Elijah said to Ahab, now this is after he'd killed all the priests of Baal. This is after the fire from heaven and all of that. Go up. Uh, Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to, his, to the top of Mount Carmel. I've been there. And he bowed down to the ground, put his face on his knees, between his knees. That implies a lot of worship going on here. And then he said to his servant, go up now and look towards the sea. It's right there on the coast in northern Israel. And so he went up and looked and, there, and, and said, there's nothing. Seven times he said, go again. I, I guess six of those seven times he said nothing. And then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. And so he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and get down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds. Now remember for three and a half years it hadn't rained at all. Not at all. So this is a powerful prayer of faith and there was a heavy rain in mean, first kings 18 verse 45 
And Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. That's a lot of miles away. I can't remember how many miles now, 30, 45 miles. I forget how many miles. And then the hand of Jehovah came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab and his chariots, okay, to the entrance of Jezreel. Okay, so that's from Mount Carmel to near the area of Megiddo. That's a few miles. God supernaturally helped him. Anyway, obviously the prayer just before this one was fervent. Also, when he prayed for Jehovah, the one true living God, to accept his sacrifice in the sight. You know, again, your Bible says the Lord, L-O-R-D. There's no the in the Hebrew. Because L-O-R-D is, in the Hebrew, Y-H-V-H, the name, the very personal name of our God. Our God is who he is, what he is. That's not his name. Because you can have false gods, but there's only one Yehovah. There's only one Y-H-V-H. That's his name. There's no the there. The only person I know who says the before his name is Donald Trump. The, the Donald, you know, <laughs> used to be called. But no, there's just Yehovah. That's his name. And so, and you'll see that this notion that the Jews have today that they don't want to even say the name, because, don't even want to say the name because it's, they might mispronounce it or it might be disrespectful. Uh, people back in Elijah's day and the prophet's day and Moses' day, they used that name in, in Abraham's day. They used that name all the time. Abraham also used it. But anyway, I have a sermon on what is the creator's name, and you should hear that if you haven't heard it. It's a two-part sermon. But anyway, 1 Kings 18, 36 to 39. You see, the other things are titles. I'm a man. It's like Jehovah is God. Okay, But man is not my name, and God is not his name. Elohim is not his name. Elohim is what he is. Because there are also false Elohim. In fact, Jehovah said in Exodus 12, I'm going to destroy the Elohim of Egypt. So how can Elohim be his name? It's not. It's what he is. He is the true one living God. Y-H-V-H is his most personal name. Adonai, my Lord, or the, my Lord, Adonai, uh, again, that's a title. He is our Lord. He is our master, our boss. That's not his name. And the word Adon, or master, was used of many, many, many people, as you'll see them later in the sermon. Anyway, I got off on a tangent there. First uh, Kings 18, 8, 36 to 39, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near, and uh, Eliyah in Hebrew, Elijah, came near and said, Jehovah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Now this is his prayer. After all the priests of Baal had cut themselves and had, had, had begged their God, Baal, or Baal, to please send uh, fire. And, and, and Baal was the God of lightning. He was the God of the, of the air and, and of the forces of lightning and so on. And so but he did not, of course, because there's no, there's no Baal. There's no... It was a conjured up God. It didn't exist. So now Elijah is trying to show Israel that there is a true living God. And this was a very fervent prayer and yet very short. Yehovah Elohim, God of Abraham, Yitzhak and Israel, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are Elohim in Israel. You are God in Israel, not Baal. And I am your servant. And that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, Jehovah, hear me, that this people may know that you are Jehovah Elohim, Lord God, okay? That you have turned their hearts back to you again. That you love them enough that you want to bring your, bring your people back to you, is what he's saying. And then the fire of Jehovah fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. I mean, Elijah even soaked his, his offerings with water, barrels of water, several times. And now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, Yehovah, he is God. Yehovah, he is God. So, by the way, Elijah, or in the Hebrew, it's Eliyahu, or Eliyah, means Yah is my God. 
Eli, or El, Eli, we say, but Eli means, El is, God, is, is another word for God. Meaning it literally means strong one. Okay, Eli, and we put an I on there, means my God. Eli, Yah, is, is Yah. My God is Yah. Yah is my God. So when they said Yahweh, he is God, they're, they're, they're actually it's a play on words on, on uh, Elijah's very name. But a very, you know, very, uh, anyway, I see that in there. But what other prayers can you think of that were fervent? Okay, so th- that was a fervent prayer. You can imagine the tension. You can imagine the, uh, the fervor and the faith that he had to have. He'd seen the priests of Baal pray and nothing happened from their God. Now he's telling all, Eli- all the people of Israel that whoever's prayer is answered, that's the servant and that's the God that we are to worship and the servant who is leading you to that worship. Imagine the faith involved with that. I've got to tell you, there'd be a lot of faith. Anyway, I think one of the most powerful prayers, it's a fervent prayer in all the Bible, of course, is our Savior's prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. I would put him as number one, and I would have used that example first, but it's just I wanted to use the context of what James said. It just made sense to me to do that. And uh, certainly the example of our Savior is the greatest example we can have of fervent prayers, and lots of them, by the way, that, that we can read about. And there are several recorded scripture we can learn, learn from. Here is God made flesh praying fervently for his Father. But he prayed often, sometimes for a very short time, and sometimes, frankly, for a long time. The most classic ones was the one in the, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Garden of Gethsemane, where he was put through an olive press. That's what Gethsemane means, olive press, the Garden of the Olive Press. In Luke 22, verses 39 to 46, it says he went there as he was accustomed. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you don't enter into temptation or testing. Pray for that, that you don't enter into testing. And... He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. He was the one who taught them to pray privately when you pray. Don't pray to be seen. Don't pray to be heard. So he went a stone's throw away. That's a good ways away. And where he, and and it says when he, he said, he said, you know, he was withdrawn a stone's throw and he knelt down and prayed. And later on, he actually falls flat on his face. He says, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, hey, I don't want to do what I want, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. He needed that, I'm sure. Being in agony. And I want you to notice here that it's okay to be in agony. That, in fact, is what a lot of the fervent prayers were. The person felt, and remember the, the word for fervently, in, in Greek is agoni, agonizome or something, agonizomai or something like that, where we get the word agony, agonize. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. So, I mean, here you see the tie of praying earnestly and agony tied together. And then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to his disciples. He found them sleeping from sorrow, and he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into trial or testing, temptation. He spoke the same words in three sessions. And he heard, and did God hear this prayer? Uh, Yes, he did hear. Hebrews 5 says God heard. But the part that God heard was not according to my will, but your will be done. And God, God did his will. In fact, God the Father did his will. There had to be. Uh, sacrifice, and aren't you glad that the Father uh, certainly let Yeshua go through the severe agony that he had to so we can all be forgiven of our sins. In Mark 14, verses 32 to 39, then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. I'm in Mark now, Mark 14. And he said, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. He began to be troubled, deeply distressed. So even our Savior at the time of his greatest agony, he was deeply distressed. If you feel deeply distressed, understand Yeshua understands that. He understands that. And then he said, 
So he'll understand this next statement too because he's been there. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. He said, I'm really sad, guys. I'm, I just about to die. I'm so sad. I'm deeply, I'm deeply troubled. I'm deeply upset. So when someone says to you and, and you're trying to pray and you tell them, I'm really upset about my wife dying or about to die. Or I'm really upset about my little girl uh, not being healed yet. Uh, come on. It's not time to say, don't be upset. Uh, our Savior was upset. He was sorrowful, even unto death. Now, he came through that, and as I said in my last sermon, he faced what had to be done, and he went forward to those people who came to arrest him. Who, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, I, I am. What a great, great Savior we have. Anyway, Mark 14, 35, he went a little further, fell on the ground. Matthew 20, 22, 39 says he fell on his face and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Ah, but all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not. Can you feel his agony? Can you feel his heart? Can you feel his fervency? Then he came and found them sleeping again. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you watch one hour? So, I mean, that was not a short little prayer there. I mean, he was praying for at least an hour, I guess, in between here. And he said, beware, you're going to fall into trial and temptation. Same word in the Greek. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. So, I mean, um, it's okay to say the same thing, but, but not these rote prayers that are just over and over and over again. It's just a bunch of words. But when your heart's in it, oh, by all means, you can repeat the same thing sometime. Please heal so and so, and you know, and and give them the blessings that they need right now. Give them the encouragement they need. You and you pray that over and over about somebody in the night. That's fine. That's not a vain repetition. In Matthew 26 verses 42 to 44, it says again the same thing, but he prayed the third, the third time, saying the same words in verse 44. Paul describes it in the book of Hebrews, assuming Paul was the author of Hebrews. Hebrews 5, verses 6 to 9, he says, In another place you're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay, Hebrews 5, 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries, vehement, vehement cries, vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard. Now, he didn't get heard the way... He first said it, that uh, you can do all things. All things are possible for you. Do we have to? I have to drink this cup, but not my will, but yours be done. He was heard that way because of his godly fear. And though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. I mean, there's a verse in Psalms where, where David says, I forget exactly where it is now. I think it's in Psalm 69 or I think it's Psalm 69 where he says, um, before I was afflicted, I went astray. So, I mean, sometimes we... Uh, you know, the, these testings and these trials and we go through drive us to God and help us to be far more fervent. But vehement cries and tears. Now, some of you guys, some of you women, have never cried in prayer. Don't resist it. If the Spirit's guiding you to plead with tears to your Father in heaven, to your Abba, to the Almighty, especially if it's for a fervent prayer for someone else, or your wife, your daughter, or someone very sick, or someone who's asking for prayer, or someone who's very low. When you pray fervently for them, God hears. And I think he's moved by when he sees that our heart is so torn up that we're even crying. Anyway, that's a thought. I, don't resist crying. Guys, please listen to that, because our Savior wept. I asked several brothers and sisters in the faith to send me what they feel about the word fervent. A sister in the faith wrote me this. I love her candor. I love her honesty. I wept, in fact, when I first read her note for its candor. Because she represents, 
I think a lot of people, if they were honest, if she was honest. And here's what our sister in Christ from the Southwest said from the South. Fervent, I'm quoting her now, as it relates to prayer. At first I see it fervent to mean a burning in one's heart to pursue speaking with God as a priority in life. When I'm fervently pursuing something, prayer as well, I feel I'm connecting deeply to that act. I see connection, trust, and sacrifice. And I see faith. It takes faith and strong belief to act or at very least be consistent and not give up. I'm still reading her note to me. Still quoting, I find connecting to God in prayer in a fervent manner can be hard. I get caught up in the world and I struggle. This is the part that brought tears to my eyes when I first heard it. I get caught up in the world and struggle to believe that God really hears me when I call on him. So I'm praying fervently for her that she will experience the knowledge and the experience that God does hear her and is there with her and in her and she and him. And recently I've been meditating, quoting from her letter again, recently I've been meditating before prayer to bring down my walls to connect with how I'm feeling, truly feeling, so I can pray honestly. And I want to be more connected with God, and therefore I know I must bring my walls down and fervently pursue this until I can unveil unveil myself to Him. Folks, that's deeper than I have normally heard. Of course, He knows what I feel already, but this process helps me to come to Him with a more open heart. Unveil myself. I love that. Unveil yourself before your Savior and Father. And then let the Spirit pray with you, as Paul tells us in Romans 8. Open up your heart. Unveiling yourself is a lot of what fervency is all about. Thank you to the lady who wrote that. Our same Savior also gave a very fervent prayer at Lazarus' resurrection. And Lazarus' story is in John 11, and I'll pick up at verses 32 to 44. It's the whole chapter, but I'll pick up at verse 32. John 11:32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Therefore, when Yeshua saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He groaned. And he said, where have you laid him? This was his, one of his best friends, remember. So though he knew he could resurrect him, he felt... He felt some agony. He, he felt the emotion of the people around. And they said, Lord, come and see. And then John eleven thirty five, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Okay, guys, don't insist that it's not unmanly to weep. Your Savior wept. I already showed you what it says in Hebrews 5 and what it says in the Gospel accounts, the Garden of Gethsemane. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could, this, could not this man open the eyes of the blind, have kept this man from dying? That must have hurt him too. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, and this is, by the way, one of the biggest keys to answered prayer. Tie, I'm going to tie it back into that lady's comment about unveiling yourself and being honest with yourself, tearing down the walls. Jesus said, take away the stone. You see, we have a stone that covers our heart sometimes, and we have to take that away and let God speak to us. And when we speak to him, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. He's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe you'd see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And then Yeshua gives a beautiful prayer. Jesus, Yeshua, lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Talk about faith. That man in behind that stone in the cave was still dead, 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 four days dead. Thank you, you have 
have already heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. That's all. That was his prayer. Now, he may have prayed because he lingered long before coming to Lazarus. He let him die first. He may have been praying extra time before he got there, but the actual prayer was very, very short. Two or three sentences. And now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with gray clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. You've heard that story before, but are you feeling the pathos, the pathos, the heart, the soul, the fervency, the groaning, the, the wrestling, the feeling of the Christ, and in this case, a short prayer, but full of power and pathos? Now, that was a short prayer. I'm going to give you an example of a long prayer. I don't personally believe that if all we do are a bunch of short prayers, that they will always be effective. I think there's times, there are times in our lives when we do need to pray much longer. Even in Gethsemane, it was several prayers of at least an hour. And there are other accounts where our Savior praying all night. For example, in Luke 6, in Luke 6, verses 12 to 16, before making major decisions, like who would be the 12 apostles, whose names would be on the 12 foundations of the heavenly Jerusalem, on the walls of the heavenly Jerusalem for forever and ever and ever. He wanted to be sure he had exactly the right people. He wanted to be sure that it wasn't just gut feeling, but, but that his father was pointing out who he wanted to be as the twelve apostles. The foundation of the New Testament group, including Christ and the prophets. In Luke 6, verses 12 to 16, it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. When it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve. So he called all his disciples, or at least seventy, or a hundred, or who knows, but at least seventy. And from those seventy or more, he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. And then it goes on to name them. My point in reading Luke 6, verses 12 to 14 and 13, have you ever, ever prayed all night about anything about anyone for anyone do you hear what I'm saying brethren I know one time my son had an injury where he banged his head real hard on the road and then he wanted to go to sleep. And I said, no, you're not going to sleep. And his face was all scratched up. And I had my wife take him to the emergency room in the hospital. I said, you take him to the emergency room. I'm going to start praying because it doesn't look good. And so um, she did. And they examined his brain. And they found that there were blood spots on the brain. And that's not ever a good thing. And um, so I prayed most of that night. While he was in the hospital, my wife was there with him, and I was at home praying. And I told her to tell him that I'm staying home praying. I don't want to be distracted. And by morning, they could find no blood spots. I wonder if the story would have ended that way had I not prayed most of that night. I can't say I was prayed all night long, but much of the night I did. Now, one of the most powerful and fervent prayers in all the Bible is by a woman who had been barren. And she, had, she was one of two wives of a Levite named Elkanah. Her name means grace. Do you know who I'm referring to? I'm referring to Hannah. In her praying for a child, her lips moved, but her words could not be heard. And so the high priest Eli assumed that she was drunk. But that prayer she prayed was answered so powerfully by God 
leading to one of the descendants of Korah, a son of Korah. One of the blogs I've written, Are You a Son of Korah? One of the most famous sons of Korah was Samuel, one of the leading prophets in all the Bible. Her prayer was obviously a fervent prayer, but we can learn a lot from her prayer also. So let's read it in 1 Samuel 1, verses 9 to 18. Anyway, so Hannah, uh, verses 9 to 18. Hannah arose after they finished eating, drinking in Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was at the time, not in Jerusalem. Now, this is before the kings. So this is during the time of the judges and all that. And um, now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of Jehovah, And she was in bitterness of soul. Fervent prayer is often the result of bitterness of soul. You're wondering where God is. Is he even hearing my prayers? Why is he not intervening? Why does he seem like he's far away? And you're wrestling with him, and I will not let you go until you bless me. Like Jacob said. And if you're a spiritual Israelite, you and I will follow that example of our forefather. I will not let you go. And, and Hannah was. So she prayed to Jehovah and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow. She said, Jehovah of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction, affliction of your maidservant, of your servant, okay, and you remember me and not forget me. Sometimes I feel like you forget me. Do you ever feel that way? But will give your male servant a male, your maid servant a male child. I will give him to Jehovah all the days of his life, and no razor will come upon his head. She basically is vowing a Nazarite vow for her son to be. And it happened as she continued praying before Jehovah that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. I might say with her heart, from her heart. Only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard. So a fervent prayer does not have to be loud. does not have to even be audible. It has to be from your heart. For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said, 1 Samuel 1 verse 14 now, So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. Okay, here's a Lord. Here's an Adon. No, my Adon. Where we get Adonai, my Lord God. Okay. Again, that's a title. She was the people. It's not his name. It's not one of his names. It's one of his titles. His name is Y-H-P-H. And the name I use for him today is Abba, Father. No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before Yehovah. That's fervent prayer. When you pour out your soul, and that comes from unveiling yourself. That comes from putting down your guard. That comes from rolling back the stone, taking away the stone. That comes from wrestling all night. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, she really, really wanted a son. And she said, when you give me a son, I'm going to give him right back to you. Anyway, she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. Of course, her name means favor or grace. And so the woman went her way and ate. Because Eli had said in verse 17, go in peace and the God of Israel grant your petition that you've asked of him. And she was no longer sad. Anyway, she gets pregnant. And after she weans the child, we pick up in verse 25 to 28, Oh, my Lord, Adon, again, as your soul lives, my Lord, she says to Eli, who was there again, she's coming back two or three years later, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to Jehovah for this child I prayed. Jehovah has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I've also lent him to Jehovah. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to Jehovah. So they worship Jehovah there. They did worship together. Eli wasn't all bad. He wasn't all bad. 
She prayed with fervency from her heart, and God heard. How many prayers could we have been answered if we would learn from Hannah, whose name means favor or grace, and just be more fervent and unveil the soul, roll away the stone, wrestle with him all night. And from the anguish of your heart, speak from your heart. As it says in verse 13, for Samuel 1, Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved. What an incredible story. Now, um, in Hannah's own word, I poured out my soul before Yehovah, and out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken. I really fear that too many times, too many of us pray quickie prayers while we're driving to work, while we're shaving, while we're doing dishes, while we're gardening. I do those things too. Yes, I do. But we need to also pray from our heart and fervently and do a lot more of that. Let the other kind of prayer be addendum prayers on top of the fervent prayer, on our knees, face between our knees, you know, down there on the ground if need be. And if we're not careful, our praying is not so much praying as it is saying our prayers rather than praying. Do you hear the difference? When we say our prayers, we're going through the routine. We're checking things off a prayer list, which is like saying so many Hail Marys or those who recite from old printed prayers rapidly over and over without even their hearts in it or even knowing what they're really saying. Kind of like the Pledge of Allegiance. If you just keep saying it over and over and over again, it means nothing after a while. When anything that we say, if it means something to us, we should think about it. So what makes a prayer fervent? It's pouring out your soul to God. It's opening up your heart. Is your prayer for others, by the way, as fervent as they are for yourself? I think it's a real danger here. We tend to be more fervent when we're the ones in trouble. That's normal. I think that's normal. Even David's prayers in the psalm, a lot of it's about his fears his problems. You don't have a lot of psalms there about others' problems. It's about his. Yeshua's prayer in Gethsemane was about his situation. I'm sure he also prayed to realize that I must go through this, I guess, because of my friend Abraham and Moses and the whole billions and billions of people that I'm dying for. And then he did come through that. But we do tend to be more fervent when we're the ones in deep trouble. At least I find that's true for me. Or am I the only one? David actually does say in one of his, where is that? I think it's Psalm 35. Psalm 35, I don't know what verse, around verse 10 if I have the right chapter. He says he actually fasted for his enemies. I afflicted my soul and they were sick or something like that he says. It's coming to me now. I'll put it in the notes, but that's why I don't have the chapter and verse. I think it's Psalm 35. But anyway, remember, the fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much. So if you're going to pray, put your heart and soul into it. Don't just do sleepy time prayers or praying just to pray kind of prayers, the check it off my to-do list kind of prayers, the distracted prayers while you're wondering how that lint and uh, dust devils or dust bunnies got all on the floor, or, you know, the, a man I respect from Northwest United States had this to say. He said, fervent prayers, you will already have in mind to use James 5, 16, Colossians 4, 12. And that's where Epaphras mentions that, uh, Paul mentions that he was laboring fervently. That's where we got the agonize, agonizame or something like that. Um, and you, you, certainly you'll have the example of Yeshua's all night prayer where he sweated blood. And so he's so true. In Colossians 4.12, Epaphras, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Laboring fervently. Now that word, agonize, agonize, I can't say it. I should have written it down. Agonize zome or something like that. That you, But the, the prayer that he was agonizing and laboring so fervently about was that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And by the way, I want to ask you folks, 
When was the last time that you prayed fervently for other people that they will stand fervently and complete and perfectly in the will of God? Or is that even on our list of things to pray about? Do we pray that for one another? We should be. My brother in Yehovah continues from the Northwest. I'll continue reading his note. Fervent for me consists of these three things. When I'm not, I mean, when I am emotionally involved, when my heart aches with sorrow. Remember Hannah? Remember Christ in Gethsemane? For what another person is suffering. When I'm passionately involved in desiring a complete and immediate positive outcome. God's will, of course. We had a great sermonette recently uh, from a man who went through a horrible, horrible testing and trial. His wife got pregnant and, and basically the child was going to be born without a brain and deformed and everything else. And like he was saying, I forget the exact wording now, but, it, you know, faith isn't just that you know everything's going to be okay, but that you're okay with no matter how things work out, no matter how God works things out. You're okay with that if God's in it. And um, now he had to learn that lesson. But there's some agony, some suffering going on through there. And so anyway, uh, and then then when I'm deeply focused, he continues here, when I'm deeply focused in the words of my prayer, remember what I said about the, uh, the the other lady mentioned that too, the unveiling of myself that I want to focus, I want to be concentrating on that. Oftentimes distractions creep in during prayer time. You ever find yourself even thinking wrong thoughts while you're praying? You rebuke those thoughts. I mean, I've had those sometimes. I say, Father, where'd that come from? You know, and so please, uh, if Satan or anybody else trying to put wrong thoughts in my mind right when I'm talking to you in the Holy of Holies, tell them to get out of here. And I repent for even having a thought that was not focused entirely on you. So he goes on to say, when there is so much concentration of what is being said, beseech that there's no room for distraction to creep in. I like that. So much concentration of what you're saying and beseeching about that there's no room for distraction to creep in from without or within. Total focus. That's fervent, he says. I like that. I like that. So first point is being emotionally involved. Your heart aches. Second one is being so deeply focused. The third one, he says, is urgency and a combination of the two above. So fervency then has to do with your heart. Emotion's good when channeled by God's Spirit. Emotion out of control. Now, even David, when Absalom, who had tried to kill David, would have killed David, was himself killed. When Absalom was killed, it says David wailed and wept so loudly that the troops wondered if they had done such a horrible thing by winning the battle with the son of David being killed. So, I mean, uh, emotion is not unbiblical. I think so many men, especially the people from uh, with English or Northern uh, European background, just hold their emotions so much. God gave us tears. He invented tears. He created tears. David, Hezekiah, even the Son of God, cried deep tears as they prayed. So don't fall prey to those who belittle proper emotion. I'm a man of emotion. And I'm not afraid of it. I'm not ashamed of it. I cried at my mother's funeral. And the minister came up and said, well, you know, um, it's okay, but blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey, it's my mother. My mother has died. And yes, I'm feeling it. I'm not ashamed to show it. So I rebuked him, even though he was an evangelist. (laughs) I just didn't think that was right. Hey, I should cry. I can cry at my mom's uh, funeral. So have your heart in your prayers. Be deeply focused, but not on the giant problem, but on the giant problem slayer, our great God. Feel the urgency. Those indeed are key ingredients of a of, of powerful prayer. Even Ishmael, who became the forefather of so many of our uh, Arabs today, God heard his voice when he was dying from thirst in the wilderness. And his mom was was uh, crying and presumably praying a, a bow shot away, and that's you know a little ways away. Genesis 21, 14 to 21, Genesis 21, God heard the voice of the lad dying in the wilderness. And then Paul and Silas, when they had been beaten and stripes, bleeding stripes, and then put in stocks and chains and a dank 
dirty old dungeon and along with other prisoners. They not only prayed, it says they sang hymns and praises, and they were heard. Acts 16, verses 25 to 31, I've used that example many times. Jehoshaphat, I've used that example many times. Second Chronicles 20, he starts out afraid of the hordes of the enemy, and he comes to himself and faces the enemy, and God, gives him, God answers the prayer. King Hezekiah, when he was being attacked by a Syrian Sennacherib, who belittled Hezekiah's God. Let's read the story. Feel the pathos. Feel the deep-seated feelings, the fervency. Feel Hezekiah's heart. Let his heart beat inside your chest as we read his story and his words. See how he addressed the problem. He had Sennacherib who had laid waste the cities and nations before them, before he came to Jerusalem. Sennacherib was saying, look, I, I've destroyed all the other gods. Your god won't be any better. So might as well give in now. So let's pick up the story in 2 Kings 19. It's also in Isaiah. 2 Kings 19, verses 14 to 21. Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers from Sennacherib, okay, the Assyrian general, and he read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of Jehovah and spread it before Jehovah. So he's doing the right thing. He goes to the temple. The house of God, okay, spreads it out before Jehovah. And then Hezekiah prayed before Jehovah. Notice how many times Jehovah is used in this passage. Over and over and over again, that's his name. God is who he is. God is not his name. It's like man is who I am. Man is not my name. Man is what I am. And so anyway, so you'll notice I'll say, where it says the Lord in, in your King James there's no that. It's, 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 it's Jehovah. That's his name. I am. The, you know, probably the best translation might be I am or eternal or something like that. Not even the eternal because that becomes a title again. And then Hezekiah prayed before Jehovah and said, Jehovah, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. So he's rebuking in his mind that that doubt that Sennacherib had put, probably tried to put into his head. And he continues, you have made heaven and earth. I'm reading 2 Kings 19, verse 16 now. Incline your ear, Jehovah, and hear. Open your, your eyes. I mean, this is strong. This is fervent language. God, can't you see? Can't you hear what's being said? Which he has said to reproach the living God. Truly, Jehovah, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their land, have cast their gods into the fire, for they weren't really gods. They're the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroy them. Now therefore, Jehovah our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Jehovah God, you alone. And then Isaiah, the son of Amos, went to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says Jehovah God of Israel, Because, because you have prayed to me, because you prayed about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Did you get that? Did you get that? How many of us could have some incredible things going on in our lives and in the lives of the people around us if you and I would learn to pray this kind of prayer all the time? Not just once in a while when your little baby girl is about to die or something, but all the time. How much are we leaving on the table that God wants to do because we're not fervent? The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. So we have to be in Christ and letting him live in us and change us and be transformed by the renewing of our mind, become righteous people. How much time do we waste? in worry and being all stressed out instead of bringing that worry and stress like Hezekiah did and spreading it out before Yahweh. If you have a letter saying that 20% of your company is going to be laid off, they don't know exactly who yet, take that letter and do a Hezekiah thing. Put it on your bed. Lay it out before Jehovah. Lay it out before your Abba, your father daddy in heaven and before your beloved savior your savior 
Behold, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. So take it to your beloved Savior, to Yeshua. Say, here's what they want to do. But you're a great God. If you're going to have me be laid off, I know you've got something better. But I don't have to be laid off if you will intervene. And I'm wrestling with you through this. I will not let you go until you give me your blessings. Fervency. Your heart. Roll away the stone. Unveil yourself. Are we getting it? Now talk about a really quick, powerfully answered prayer. Go to Nehemiah chapter 2. This one was so quick, it's unbelievably quick. And it's done in one's mind, but it's apparently answered and apparently powerfully. Here's what happened, Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah is hearing reports about what's going on in Jerusalem, how it needs to be rebuilt now it's all in wreck and, and, and it's all in wreckage and shambles. Nehemiah two, this was in the month of Nisan, right around Passover time, which is coming up here soon. Nehemiah two verses one to five. When I say come it's coming to us soon, uh, as I'm recording this, okay, I'm recording this the middle part of March and we're a month away yet, but we're coming up to Nisan soon. Nehemiah two verses one to five, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, or it used to be called Abiv. In the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. He was the wine, he was the wine, uh, the cup bearer, okay, and the the wine taster and all of that. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. It's very dangerous to be sad, very dangerous not to be uh, upbeat and everything, because then they could think, I wonder what he's plotting. I wonder if he's trying to plot an assassination or something. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad, since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of the heart. What's going on, Nehemiah? Or Nehemiah, as they say in Hebrew. So I became dreadfully afraid, because he could be killed for that. And I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste? And its gates are burned with fire. The king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king. Now now get this. Don't just read right over that. Don't just read right over that. He's asked a question. I'm sorry, I had to cough there. Um, He's asked a question. What do you request? And I prayed to the God of heaven. That's a real quickie, fast prayer of seconds long at most, maybe one or two seconds. I don't know what he, what you'd say except, oh, Yehova, hear me and give me wisdom what to say. And then you say it. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servants found favor in his sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And he goes on from there. I mean, just incredible. He got some answers, wonderful answers. What I like about Nehemiah's fervent prayer, Nehemiah, is that it was for Jerusalem. It wasn't for himself. Do you and I ever, ever even pray for Jerusalem with our hearts, with feeling, with agony over what happens in Jerusalem even today? And what we know is going to happen in the years ahead. It won't be pretty at first. Psalm 122.6. I'll read you a bunch of verses quickly from, and I'll put them in the notes. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Are we ever doing that? We should be. Psalm 137, verses 5 and 6. While the Jews were in captivity, they remembered Zion, and this is what they said. Psalm 137, 5 and 6. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, it starts in Psalm 137, with them being by the rivers of Babylon. Let my right hand forget its skill if I forget, if I don't exalt Jerusalem. Above my chief joy, my tongue might as well cleave to my mouth. And then in Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7, I've set watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. 
They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of Jehovah, do not keep silent. Give him no rest till he establishes and till he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Give him no rest until this happens. Doesn't that remind you again of Yaakov, of Jacob? Jacob saying, I will not let you go. He was given a request, a command from God saying, let me go for the day breaks. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Oh, man, so are you getting it? I'm thinking fervent prayer has more to do with speaking from our hearts, opening up our hearts, unveiling the self, and opening up before God even our complaints like Hannah did. And she said, but from my complaints from the heart, my complaints and my agony of soul, even our fears. But we've been told for so long to... uh, not let our fears be, 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 but that's part of fervency. That's part of emotion. And, and, and so don't stay there in fear, but it's okay to express your fears. I mean, even Yeshua said, I could die in Gethsemane. I'm, I'm in so much anguish, I could die. I don't know how you would feel if that finally were you. And you've seen real crucifixions, and none of us has ever seen that unless you go to Iraq and Syria, where they crucify children and their fathers in the streets. Christian children and fathers in the streets. But if you've seen how they did crucifixions, whether today or back then, and you're being told you're going to be crucified, yeah, you'd have some agony, you'd have some fear. In Hebrews 12, we think of Moses. I'll give you a couple of examples here. Where you, you pray even though the fear is there. Moses, we think of him going up in the Mount Sinai, which was all ablaze. And if Moses was kind of, in my mind, it was kind of like a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego kind of situation of fire and heat all around. Uh, Almighty God had to supernaturally protect Moses from being burnt, from what I could tell doesn't take a lot of fire before you're, you're being burned, uh, you know, even, even though it's not right on you. Anyway, Hebrews 12, verse 20 to 21, talking about Mount Sinai. They could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I'm exceedingly afraid and trembling. And yet when God called him to go up that burning mountain, because the Bible says the whole mountain was ablaze and shaking and earthquakes and loud peals, peal, peals of thunder and lightning and, and that long blast. And Moses even describes it some more in Deuteronomy 9, verses 15 to 20. How he, I'll, I'll read it to you. But I'm, my, my point in coming to this is don't think that it's wrong to tell God you're scared to death about something, about him, about something you're going through. Come through that fear, but present it to God also. Moses is recounting this to the nation of Israel, getting ready to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy 9, verses 15 to 20. So I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire. And the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned before Jehovah your God. You had made yourselves a molded calf. He talks about that, how I threw down the two tablets. And I fell down before Jehovah. And he made them, and as at the first, 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of of Jehovah to provoke him to anger. So I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure which which Jehovah was angry with you to destroy you. I was afraid of that. But Jehovah listened to me at that time also. So Jehovah was a very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at that same time. David says in Psalm 56 verses 3 and 4, Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust you. And there's so many examples, so many examples. I won't go into all of them. I, I had them all in my notes, but I, I think you get the point. 
the transfiguration, uh, when the disciples heard the voice, this is my beloved son in whom I will please, they fell on their faces, were greatly afraid. What did Jesus say? He says, don't be afraid. And then in the resurrection, you know, after the resurrection, he comes and sees them uh, assembled together for fear of the Jews. And he comes suddenly appears in the midst of them. He says, shalom, peace. Don't be afraid. And over and over again. Another huge point about fervent prayer, and we'll wrap it up, is this. The prayer that Abba in heaven actually receives from you, especially if you're troubled in anguish and despair and agony of heart, and you're not even making sense in what you say. Have you ever prayed like that? If you could record what you were saying, maybe it was mostly sobs. Or maybe it was mostly just, I don't know, you just, you wanted to be clearer than that. In Romans 8, verses 25 to 28, it says, If we hope for what we don't see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so it goes on to say how the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I think that is so beautiful. So when you pray and you don't feel like your prayers are as coherent as the ones we've been talking about here, your prayer actually may be more like Hannah's sometimes, where in the agony of her soul, she was weeping. And God heard that prayer. We have the Holy Spirit today interpreting and making intercession for us. So children of the highest, that's you, and that's me. How much are you leaving undone? Because you're not praying at all. Or if you are praying, our prayers are too dull. Repetitious, sleepy time prayers that don't do much good because they're not fervent. What could happen if we could just learn to pray more fervently? What miracles would we be seeing? What power would we be seeing in the body of Christ? If just even a tenth of us or 20 or 30 percent of the group would get this message and start doing it. If I would just start doing it. Or are we going to be the lazy, sleepy time Sardis or Laodiceans who are neither hot. They're not fervent. They're not fervere. They're not boiling over. Nor are they cold. But that murky land in between. How much more could we be doing as children of God, bonded together, coming together, be doing if we would come together as one body, one mind, one heart, quit the infighting, pray more often, pray for each other, pray more fervently. One of the biggest mistakes that children of God make and the enemies of God make is misjudging the power of fervent, frequent prayer to God Almighty in heaven. Faithful prayer. Prayer is one big tool we all claim to understand, but do so little truly fervent praying, I believe, if we're truly honest with ourselves, and I include myself. And I've actually repented for not being more fervent in my praying. So let you and I decide right now we're going to be different going forward. We're praying fervent prayers from now on for the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Unveil yourself. Roll away the stone. Open up your heart. Focus. Let the emotion you feel about something come out in the prayer, even if it's a complaint. It's okay. As long as you take it to God. And don't just complain about him or to others, but take it to him like Hannah did. As long as you do that. Bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, our great 
great Abba, our dear Daddy, and Yeshua, our wonderful Savior, our beloved Yeshua. Help us fall in love with you. Help us love what you love and hate the sins that you hate. Help us love the people you love and we will become far more fervent if we learn to love as you love and feel as you feel. You did not send your son to the world to condemn the world, so we must stop that too. Sometimes we just get condemning in our hearts and we get jaded because we don't see the answered prayers like we read about in the word. Maybe we don't see the answered prayers because it's our fault. We're not fervent enough. We're not unveiling the heart. I want to stop that, Father, and I know those who are here with me on this website. I know many of them, my heart feels it, feel the same way. Forgive your people. Forgive all of us for the infighting. Forgive all of us or anything we have left unforgiven of other people. Let us love as you loved, and you loved us so much you died for us while we're still sinners. And let us be willing in our hearts to die for one another, and therefore even pray fervently for one another, even our enemies, even those who wish us evil. And Anyway, we ask your blessing on your people. May your face shine on them. And may you protect our people, your people. And may you bring them blessings as they seek you. And may you be pleased with your people. Bless Light on the Rock. Bless other groups, works that are in tune with what you're doing. Bring us together. We love you, dear God in heaven. We love you, dear Jesus, our Yeshua. May we love you even more. Teach us how to love you. Teach us how to be fervent. Teach us how to be just like you. Yeshua, we want to be just like you. Thank you and our Heavenly Father's mighty glory be to you, Heavenly Father, in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. This. The prayer that Abba in heaven actually receives from you, especially if you're troubled in anguish and despair and agony of heart, and you're not even making sense in what you say. Have you ever prayed like that? If you could record what you were saying, maybe it was mostly sobs. Or maybe it was mostly just, I don't know, you just, you wanted to be clearer than that. In Romans 8, verses 25 to 28, it says, If we hope for what we don't see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so it goes on to say how the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I think that is so beautiful. So when you pray and you don't feel like your prayers are as coherent as the ones we've been talking about here, your prayer actually may be more like Hannah's sometimes, where in the agony of her soul she was weeping. God heard that prayer. We have the Holy Spirit today interpreting and making intercession for us. So children of the highest, that's you, and that's me. How much are you leaving undone? Because you're not praying at all. Or if you are praying, our prayers are too dull. 
repetitious, sleepy time prayers that don't do much good because they're not fervent. What could happen if we could just learn to pray more fervently? What miracles would we be seeing? What power would we be seeing in the body of Christ? If just even a tenth of us or 20 or 30 percent of the group would get this message and start doing it. If I would just start doing it. Or are we going to be the lazy, sleepy time Sardis or Laodiceans who are neither hot? They're not fervent. They're not fervere. They're not boiling over. Nor are they cold. But that murky land in between. How much more could we be doing as children of God, bonded together, coming together, be doing if we would come together as one body, one mind, one heart, quit the infighting, pray more often, pray for each other, pray more fervently. One of the biggest mistakes the children of God make and the enemies of God make is misjudging the power of fervent, frequent prayer to God Almighty in heaven. Faithful prayer. Prayer is one big tool we all claim to understand, but do so little truly fervent praying, I believe, if we're truly honest with ourselves, and I include myself. And I've actually repented for not being more fervent in my praying. So let you and I decide right now we're going to be different going forward. We're praying fervent prayers from now on for the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Unveil yourself. Roll away the stone. Open up your heart. Focus. Let the emotion you feel about something come out in the prayer, even if it's a complaint. It's okay. As long as you take it to God. And don't just complain about him or to others, but take it to him like Hannah did. As long as you do that. Bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, our great, great Abba, our dear Daddy, and Yeshua, our wonderful Savior, our beloved Yeshua. Help us fall in love with you. Help us love what you love and hate the sins that you hate. Help us love the people you love. And we will become far more fervent if we learn to love as you love. And feel as you feel. You did not send your son to the world to condemn the world, so we must stop that too. Sometimes we just get condemning in our hearts. And we get jaded because we don't see the answered prayers like we read about in the word. Maybe we don't see the answered prayers because it's our fault. We're not fervent enough. We're not unveiling the heart. I want to stop that, Father, and I know those who are here with me on this website, I know many of them, my heart feels it, feel the same way. Forgive your people. Forgive all of us for the infighting. Forgive all of us for anything we have left unforgiven of other people. Let us love as you loved. And you loved us so much you died for us while we're still sinners. And let us be willing in our hearts to die for one another. And therefore even pray fervently for one another, even our enemies, even those who wish us evil. And Anyway... We ask your blessing on your people. May your face shine on them. And may you protect our people, your people. And may you bring them blessings as they seek you. And may you be pleased with your people. Bless Light on the Rock. Bless other groups, works that are in tune with what you're doing. Bring us together. We love you, dear God in heaven. We love you, dear Jesus, our Yeshua. May we love you even more. 
teach us how to love you. Teach us how to be fervent. Teach us how to be just like you. Yeshua, we want to be just like you. Thank you and our Heavenly Fathers. Mighty glory be to you, Heavenly Father, in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.